Salawete. It's great to have several of you joining us to um, examine the topic, or I should say the maxim of Festina Lente. Keep calm and Festina Lente. Make haste slowly. Some of you have tuned in for uh, my uh, general overview of uh, the eight essential principles of classical pedagogy. The first principle that I mentioned in that overview or that survey was Festina Lente. It's a Latin maxim that has uh, quite a, a long history and it embodies proverbial wisdom. And it embodies proverbial wisdom that is um, appropriate not just to students, and we're going to certainly think about students uh, as a primary focus, but to everyone really in any profession. Uh, making haste slowly or festina lente is wisdom that we should all heed. In fact, Erasmus, when he writes about this in the 16th century, says that this particular proverb or adage should be carved on columns. It should be etched in monuments for everyone to see in all kinds of places to reflect on and apply. So we would do well to heed Erasmus's advice and think and reflect on this maxim. I think it, if we did, it would have um, some positive beneficial uh, uh, consequences or um, effects on uh, all areas or many areas of our lives. Better be careful about using such universalistic language. It's going to help you in every way, at every time, and in every activity with everybody. But if it's a proverb, it probably is going to have wide application, even if not universal application. So I want to welcome you. Before I get started, I also want to let you know that um, Classical Academic Press, um, because of a lot of demand from, and questions from, from lots of you, has decided to uh, carry some, um, some, some books that are resources to help you with these kinds of topics. Of course, Classical Academic does produce curricula, but you know, as a part of creating curricula, classical curricula, we're constantly thinking about the best educational practices of the past. So we're engaged in a kind of philosophic endeavor, thinking about just what education is or should be and how we can learn from the past as well as the present. So that's what we're doing at Classical Academic, along with a lot of other publishers that are joining in the renewal of classical education or liberal arts education, especially in the K through 12 area. As a result of doing this kind of educational archaeology, um, it's necessary to read some books. And a lot of you have said, well, what books should I read? So we're starting to recommend some of the ones that have been most influential to us and carry them on our website. So let me show a few of them to you. I, I promise you this will be brief. <laughs> you weren't expecting an advertisement right at the beginning. But these are books that relate to the topic of Festina Lente particularly uh, this one, Leisure, The Basis of Culture by Joseph Pieper. Um, an excellent book that teaches us that uh, education, classically considered, was significantly a, a matter of reflection, contemplation, conversation, uh, giving us leisure time to really think about the things that are most important, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And Joseph Pieper, better than anyone I know, in the first 80 pages of this book, uh, recovers that wisdom for us. Um, so recommend you take a look at this. Uh, another one I, I have in my bag. You won't see this one quite yet on the. You won't see this one quite yet on our website, but it's coming. It's called the Intellectual Life: uh, Its Spirit, Conditions, and Methods by A. G. Certelange, French thinker. Um, he recovers this whole idea of what are the uh, habits, traits, and virtues, characteristics that a student should have in order to properly be considered a student. Uh, it's not a highbrow book about being uh, attaining a really high IQ. It's really a matter of figuring out how to live a life of a student and how to cultivate and develop virtues that would result in a student. And as we talk about Festina Lente today, we're going to be talking about, and from one perspective, uh, a virtue. And we'll discuss that in just a moment. Um, a couple of other books, this one, Plato's Republic, especially book three and eight, are really great classical reading on what it means to be an educated human being from the great philosopher Plato. You don't have to read the entire Republic, although I recommend that highly, but if you read just book three and eight, you're gonna come across some uh, very wise suggestions about what it means 
to be a student. Uh, it's Plato who says that teaching young children should in, involve a lot of playfulness, that children should be at play when they work, not that when they're as a student, not that everything they do is play, but a, a lot of what we do with younger students is to show them how to be playful, to play with ideas, to play with the things that they're learning. Um, and I'll mention just one other that's related to Festina Lente a bit, this book, Desiring the Kingdom by Jamie Smith or James K.A. Smith, the philosopher um, from uh, Calvin College, is tremendous on how we actually create students, not just by standing in front of a whiteboard like I'm doing right now, but by creating rhythms, traditions, routines that really shape and form their ideal of what it means to be a student, a human being, and to flourish as a student or a person. Um, love to say more about that, but um, to leave it leave it there for now. All right. <clears throat> so we do want to keep calm and festina lente. Uh, the Latin festina lente means make haste. Festina lente, slowly. Um, it's from the Greek, which is could uh, underneath it here for those of you who are Greek readers. Spude brados. Uh, make haste slowly. So this maxim existed in Greek as well as in Latin, has a long history. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about its history for a moment. Um, you're aware of the fable, uh, Aesop's fable, the tortoise and the hare. Well, um, you know how that fable goes. I, I'll, I'll, really all I need to do is mention the fable and you've, you've got it, right? That there is a rabbit who is quick and he can dart about and he can get places fast and he knows it. And as a result, he tends to be, allow himself to be diverted. Um, he will take a little rabbit trail here and there. And when he engages with the race, with the hare, with the tortoise rather, a rabbit hare, it's two similar animals, um, he, you know, they, they take off and everyone of course is betting on the rabbit, uh, but the rabbit does succumb to some of his diversionary interests. And before you know it, the tortoise slowly making his way through the course is making some significant but slow headway. The rabbit thinks he's got plenty of time. He can smell a few roses and so forth. And of course, you know how this, this fable ends. The tortoise actually wins. And this can happen with students. I've worked with students for a long time. And I've, I've seen some students that start off as tortoises and end up beating the hares that are in the class. Um, I'm thinking of a, a mathematics student. I remember a mathematics student who, say around sixth, seventh, eighth grade, was really showing himself to be um, gifted in mathematics. But, you know, he would uh, basically not study too much. He didn't seem to need to in order to get A minus grades pretty, pretty easily, almost effortlessly. And then there was a few other students I knew who had to work, had to spend sometimes two, three times as much time doing homework and reviewing mathematics in order to get a similar grade or even worse. And then I saw as the years go by some of those kinds of tortoise students becoming more adept and more uh, capable in mathematics than the rabbit who had been lazy. So maybe we could just stop there. There it is. That's Festina Lente and we'll apply that. To, you can just generalize that to a lot of other subjects and a lot of other studies and I think you've got it. Ah, but do we really get it? Because it takes a good bit of reflection to really work this deeply through all of our lives as human beings and as students. Why is that so? Why is it that we can understand the wisdom of the tortoise and the hare, but not really consistently live like it, not apply its wisdom? Ah, well, the answer to that has a lot to do with living in 21st century America with all of our own diversions and distractions. Uh, oops, just give me a second. <laughs> okay, um, uh, sorry. Uh, you know what I mean. So there's all kinds of things that are, not, not all of them are bad. I, I think a smartphone is actually a good thing in many ways, but in some cases it can tempt us and it can become a bad thing because we don't know how to use the technology responsibly. Lots of diversions in America. Um, one book comes to mind, Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, the Greek word uh, amusia, from which we get amusement, meant to be without inspiration. It meant to be amusia, uh, without music. 
without the inspiration of the muses. Whereas music was meant we were in direct uh, collaboration with the muses. So we are amused so easily. And that means we are distracted easily from the things that really matter. And therefore, we don't make the kind of progress developing and growing uh, wisdom, skills, knowledge, virtue, eloquence. These things are given the short shrift because these things only come with time. Time where there is regular, consistent study and reflection. So if we were... Well, let me stop for a moment and show you some images because we're going to we're going to kind of deep dive into this, this subject. I've I've shown you a keep calm and festing keep calm and festing Valente, but um, I want to show you a couple of other um, well known images. Um, here is an image that was used in the ancient world. It features um, features the the hair inside of the shell of a snail. Festina Lente. Paradoxically, you make the most progress and speedily when you slow down and you're deliberate and intentional. There's a sense in which you need to be a snail and a rabbit at the same time. There's one image which I don't think I printed for you or got hung up on the printer that shows um, a tortoise with a sail on, uh, fixed on top of his shell, and that was a very popular image as well. Another common image that was used by uh, Roman emperors was the, uh, the image of the crab and the butterfly. This is uh, from the Emperor Vespasian. And you see the crab go slowly, the butterfly can dart. Both of these things were necessary. And both of these things were necessary to be a capable ruler and a capable military commander. A lot of writing talking about how kings and princes and military commanders needed to be very deliberate, thoughtful, and intentional, and even use tactics of delay and not rush in a rash way into battle. So, so important that the Emperor Augustus and Vespasian put these images right on their gold coins. Um, show you another example. This one was quite, quite popular. This is the anchor and the dolphin. Now, which one do you think represented speed and which one represented deliberation, restraint, reflection, intentionality? Yes, the anchor, deliberation, and the dolphin, considered to be the speediest fish. Uh, uh, Pliny writes in his letters and says that the dolphin was the fastest of fish and compares it to the, the darting speed of our minds. And Plato's going to talk about this as well. Um, he says that our, our passions, uh, the, the, that part of us that wants to dart about, actually needs to be controlled by our reason. And there's a part of our mind that it darts about. And, and uh, that part needs to be in control by another part of the mind that would restrain it properly. So he compares uh, our desires to like uh, galloping horses that need to be reined in by reason. Well, you might also notice... Uh, that there's a Latin phrase here. Um, it's a name. It's the name of uh, Aldus. Aldus. Um, and this comes from Aldus Manutius, who was a 16th century printer from Venice, Italy. And he was reprinting a lot of new uh, manu uh, found uh, ant uh, ancient uh, literature. Um, Erasmus writes about him in his book, The Adagia, The Adages, or The Proverbs. And Erasmus gives a lot of praise to Aldus, and he says, <clears throat> Aldus is doing something really important. He is gathering ancient wisdom and then meticulously editing and amending and correcting all of the various manuscripts to get a really good copy of, say, Quintilian or Cicero and so forth. And then he is printing them and distributing them uh, um, throughout, throughout the West. And he talks about how important it is for an editor and a publisher. And this... And of course, strikes near to me um, how important it is for an editor and publisher to festina lente, to make haste slowly. And he criticizes those publishers who were quick to release corrupted manuscripts that, that had all kinds of errors in them um, to the public in order to make a dime. 
and he says Aldous has made a good bit of money and acquired a good reputation among thinkers and writers and students and teachers all over the West because he has made haste slowly. He didn't rush to print. He made sure he did things correctly along the way. Um, and so he, um, uh, this is uh, uh, Aldous, takes the same symbol that actually existed uh, all the way into the early uh, Roman Empire and puts it and uses it as a logo for his books. And let me show you an example of the same, if you will, logo from the emperor. I think this is also Vespasian. You see there the dolphin and the anchor. So this proverb wasn't just thought about. It was it was made public. It was on. It was in popular culture. It was on the. It was on coins, and it was also carved in granite. Uh, I have an example of that that I didn't print as well. Um, it was considered to be proverbial wisdom. Um, maybe just a couple more images, and then I'll leave the images. Uh, here is a modern rendition of the crab and the butterfly, still being used today. Um, I think that's it for the images. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at one more image because it's mentioned in several other places in, in ancient literature, and that's the image of a tree. Uh, this isn't a very good image of a tree because because I drew it and made me think of a a brain and a brain stem. Uh, but this is uh, to be uh, some kind of a fruit tree, maybe an apple tree. Uh, trees grow slowly, and in order for their fruit to come to us, it takes time. So um, there are classical uh, co-ops and schools that I know of that are actually using the tree as a metaphor. I know of a school called Tall Oaks and the Oaks Academy, uh, thinking about children coming to us like, uh, like acorns that need to be cultivated and grow slowly over time. Now, how is this in contradiction to what we want in modern education? Well, we want things quickly. Um, we're, we're a nation that wants immediate gratification and we want to think that we can acquire skills quickly too and just jump into things often. So we have um, people who become musicians without ever studying this, the, uh, the chromatic scale or doing chord theory. Uh, maybe they'll come to that later. We have language study in which we don't study grammar. We just jump into conversational Spanish or French or what have you and try to acquire some speaking capacity with the language despite the fact we don't know the principles which guide it because we want to speak Spanish so quickly. As a result, we do learn to speak it. We learn to converse in Spanish really badly. <laughs> and we get, to, we get to Mexico and we can order a taco and an enchilada, but we sound like an uneducated person there. Um, the way folks sometimes sound when they first come to the United States and haven't studied English grammar. Um, we want things quickly and, and what we sometimes get is shortchanged. And because we don't master each step along the way, we don't really acquire the kind of capacity that perhaps we really long for. Let's talk about this a little further by looking at three different ways that we can talk about Festi Nolente. Um, and this is coming from um, Erasmus in his book, The Adages, or uh, uh, Adagia, or Adagia. Um, he says that there are three ways we can take this, this proverb. Well, the first is to say it means to think before we act. It involves deliberate thinking, deliberation, um, a restrained kind of thinking, and that, that we need to make sure before we engage in anything that's uh, important or significant that we give some proper thoughtful analysis before we actually act. So prior to deliberation, uh, excuse me, prior to performance or action, there is deliberation. You've heard of some cor corollary phrases like think before you act. Uh, think before you speak. Uh, th that's appropriate in, in, a, in maybe a, a briefer context, but even uh, in a larger context, like before you go to war, maybe some very careful planning. In fact, there's a there's one maxim that says that uh, you should you should make long preparation for war in order that you can win the war quickly. And this is, of course, where emperors and kings thought about this. So thinking before acting. Another uh, way of looking at this, and we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit more in a minute, is, is passions being restrained by reason. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, restraining rash impulses 
excessive ambitions to act. Um, we need to restrain that. That's Plato, again, speaking in that, in that tradition, one of the earliest ones. He's, he's the one who said that uh, our passion should be like subjects, ruled by the king, which is reason. And then finally, Erasmus says it, it can simply mean to avoid headlong speed. Um, um, he quotes Cato, fast enough if done well enough, and what grows slowly and steadily can endure, which is Jerome. What virtues, as, as we're thinking of this maxim and its implications, what, what virtues do you think it's connected to? If you had to name a virtue or two that describes this phrase, festina lente, what virtue comes to your mind? Well, that's talked about. Uh, how about vices? What, what would be the opposite of festina lente? What kind of words come, come, in, come into your head when, when I ask you that question? What's the opposite of making haste slowly? Well, I think uh, diligence and temperance are probably the chief virtues that are related to Festina Lente. So Festina Lente is embodying, uh, helping students to cultivate diligence, which, mean, which is also related to patience and in, in industry. The diligence is being able to tenaciously stay with a task or a process or a work uh, through the challenges to be diverted and to leave it. It's related to constancy. Um, I frequently talk about the Latin roots to these virtues because they're, they're, they're enlightening. Sometimes the Latin root isn't terribly enlightening, but in these, in these cases they are. Diligence comes from uh, diligo diligere, which means to esteem highly or prize. So if you, to love, in fact, Jerome used uh, diligere to, to translate John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he used Delegare. Uh, so God so esteemed and prized the world that he sent his only son. So you will study and you will be focused on those things that you love. And that's why it's so important to cultivate love for truth, goodness, and beauty as a way to attain diligence. And I think this is also going to help us to slow down, to be intentional, to be deliberate, in order to truly master things as we go. Um, Temperance. Temperance means to, to give things their proper proportion, time, and effort. And the opposite of these two things would be sloth, which is laziness, and hot, uh, excessive ambition. Uh, I also put up the word hot-headedness here. Ah, excessive ambition. You see, to be intemperate, you can be intemperate in two ways. You can be intemperate in the direction of being lazy, not giving enough effort and time and attention to a task or a study, or you can give too much time or excessive attention or take on something before it's time. To vainly try your hands at something uh, for which your own capacities have not properly matured and developed or ripened to. So, and, and those of you who are homeschoolers, have you felt this temptation come to you from time to time to encourage your child to take on, to accelerate, to take on a new uh, skill, to take on some new work um, because you think he can do it? He, um, that's maybe two grades ahead, three grades ahead. Uh, yeah, that's kind of exciting. Uh, to be able to say, well, my son is doing such and such. But sometimes what we do is we're excessively ambitious and we, we try things for which we're really not quite prepared for. For example, in mathematics, you, you know, this standard example I use and others have used it, uh, you, know, you can't teach long division without having mastered what? You have to have mastered your math facts. You have to have mastered addition and subtraction multiplication before you can go to long division. So to, if a student somehow was able to kind of intuitively grasp how to do long division before really having mastered those things, would it be a good thing to let them go and just start doing long division? Or should we require that that student slow down and master each step along the way? So in mathematics, it's very important because it is a cumulative study that you do really show mastery of each step. You know, right now, there is a movement among uh, uh, some people in, in the math curricula creation 
to do away with mastering uh, logarithms, which means just basic math functions like math facts, because we have calculators, and to start thinking more analytically about math without bothering or taking the time to really memorize, say, the multiplication table, because I have a calculator in my pocket. Um, in my view, that might be being uh, foolish. It might be violating the principle of fessina lente. Let's look at some other examples. Uh, I, may, I mentioned an example from mathematics, and I think this would this would apply all the way through, not just knowing the uh, you know, multiplication, addition, and subtraction before going to long division, but in other advanced um, uh, mathematics as well. Uh, but let's talk about reading. Um, you know, to begin reading, it's important to master letters, it's important to master blends, three-letter words, sight words, and so on, phonics, um, as a way of actually taking off. And I think it's a, a good example because uh, the whole language instruction, which is now starting, I think, to wane, but uh, still strong in many places, says, you know, the, the idea between whole language instruction, uh, among other things, is that students can learn to read without having to take the time to master phonics uh, and phonemes. Um, and, and then maybe they'll pick up that, they'll pick up how to sound out words as they go, but let's start teaching them sight words, get them reading, get them excited about, about, about little books and things that they're reading. Uh, but you know, so this is people, students who are learning this way seem at first to be reading. You know, first grader will come home and they're reading these little books because they've learned a lot of sight words. But they don't have the skills to read words that are new. They can't decode words that they haven't seen before with other combinations of letters. So the student who's learning phonics may at first seem to be progressing more slowly, but he's actually going faster. He is festina lente. He is making haste slowly. He is going to soon uh, surpass the student who has uh, only learned uh, language by the whole language uh, the theory of instruction. Um, there's a famous chemist now, now I'm skipping up to graduate school. <laughs> I'm going from uh, primary school to graduate school. But there's a chemist named Bohr who, who was talking about reflecting on the students who came to him from various high schools. And he said that the students who came to him uh, from uh, the schools that had focused on su studying science a great deal, when they come into their his chemistry program, would do better than the students who had been in a more, lib uh, more well-rounded liberal arts education where they didn't study as much science but had learned a good bit of Latin and literature and so forth. He said, the students who came in with the, the focus on science studies at first surpassed the students who had come in with a liberal arts education. But then he said, uh, after a year or two, the students who had studied liberal arts, the liberal arts more generally, began to surpass the students who had focused on science in their high school years. And he said, give me a student who knows his Latin, and I shall be responsible for his chemistry. That's making haste slowly. Let's take a look at some other uh, areas. And, and some of you who are you know, homeschooling educators and school educators, you're thinking right now about your own own topic. Um, uh, study of Latin, uh, the study of music, sports. Can you see how uh, mastering the important essential skills is so important to actually attaining more in the long run? It actually speeds up things. See, we need to, to think of Festina Lente not in terms of today, not in terms of just this week or this month, but actually over, say, 13 years or 18 years of education. What's really going to equip me to be the most effective over a 15-year period? That should enter into our thinking as well. Ah, well, just to, to mention sports for, for, for a moment, um, take, take uh, basketball. Um, it's pretty important to master the fundamentals. And once those fundamentals are just second nature so that you can dribble without thinking and switch hands without thinking and possibly even shoot with either hand without thinking, um, that kind of muscle memory uh, uh, overtaught skill enables a basketball player to look quite natural and be very effective. Um, and you, we know this because you'll look at someone who's really well skilled this way and think, oh, I look so natural, I can do that. And then when you try, you of course fail miserably. Well, that came from a person who engaged in festing alente mastering the fundamentals, mastering each step along the way. So in, from one perspective, we can say that Festina Lente is related very much to this idea of mastery learning. Uh, we don't want to skip ahead. We don't want to leave gaps. We, we want to make sure that we master all the important parts as a way of mastering the whole. Um, 
is uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book um, Outliers, A Story of Success, cites some studies that seem to show that if you're going to become the best that you can in a particular discipline, you're going to have to spend some time doing so. In other words, there aren't a lot of shortcuts. If you're going to become a master violinist and to become the best violinist you can be, you'll probably have to put in, on average, 10,000 hours, which is about three or four hours a day over the course of 10 years. That's a good bit of time, but how, how quickly does 10 years go by? So if you want to become a true master, think about 10 years of time. 10 years of time at about three hours a day. Now we're talking mastery. So we make haste, slowly. Ah, well, the kings, I'm going to uh, dart around just a little bit, and, and then uh, I also would ask you to, um, uh, we're going to try to take some questions. Um, we're working with this technology. If it doesn't work, I'll just let you know, I'm sorry, it didn't work. Uh, you can still post your questions, and I can answer them later online. You can go back and check in the comment section. But if we're able to pull them up uh, uh, live here, I'll try to answer some of them live as well. I just We had a little trouble with that last time, so I'm giving you that caveat. Uh, kings needed to learn this. Um, a haste, uh, one, one writer says that the, the worst combination that you could find in a king, the last thing you'd want to see is a combination of uh, hastiness and rashness, or hastiness and hot-headedness. Um, well, with students, it's similar. Um, another couple of uh, corollaries that I wanted to make sure I mentioned um, is uh, two, two famous ones I, I know you know. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, do you remember what he said about Festi Valente? Haste makes waste. Um, and then the carpenter's maxim. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Um, measure twice, cut once. Um, so I think that you see this. So I'd like to just summarize now with a couple of comments about education in general and then take some of your questions. Festi Nalente is, um, um, and now that you think about it, or say haste makes waste, can become wisdom for us that's become cliched. It can become something that we've heard so much that it really just uh, bounces off of us or slides off of our back. I think that would be the case, say, with haste makes waste. Um, we think we've got it, but we don't. That's why I like using the Latin. <laughs> just, just translating into Latin kind of makes us think about it in a different way. Festi lente. And now we're thinking more deeply and in maybe even more sustained way about the same basic idea, haste makes waste. Um, so will you, will you commit to thinking about this? Because I think the what's... It's this, uh, this marriage between uh, theory and practice or principles and practice. We need to spend some time really thinking about these principles and clarifying them well, even in general ways. And as we do that, the applications to the classroom and to working with students will start to suggest themselves. So I wonder if some of you might even share a comment instead of a question, just sharing with the group that's here ways in which you have, even if you haven't heard this particular Latin maxim before, have applied this wisdom to good effect with your own students. Uh, maybe some of you could make some connections in some of these other, other, and, and other arts and subjects besides the ones I've mentioned. Um, what about in history? What about in literature? Uh, how do these things apply? Um, make those connections for us and share your experiences for us so that we can, we can, we can archive that. Um, I think when it comes to literature, it's one way we make haste slowly is we choose the very best literature and we don't waste our time on what Charlotte Mason calls twaddle. Uh, we even try to make the very difficult decisions between what is good and what is best. Uh, reading the best literature in the long run is going to do a lot more to cultivate our souls, to be wise, than just reading whatever happens to be on the bestseller list, etc. I think I'll make my last comment about this word, maturo, because it's actually a synonym for festina. Um, and yes, it's related to our word, mature. We could, we could also say, in addition to festina lente, we could say matura lente. And it could be translated similarly, make haste slowly. Uh, because matura does mean to speed up. 
But it also, of course, has connected to it this idea of ripening, ripening to maturity. maturity. And so maybe this will help you to think a little bit differently about maturity, about actually helping your students to become a mature, ripe fruit, a, a, a full-grown tree. To have reached maturity, it's interesting, at its root is this idea of speed that is appropriate to the task, um, kind of natural speed, naturally calibrated to what is best for ripening and maturity. And then maybe you'll think about the uh, the anchor and the dolphin. That's what this is uh, supposed to be. And uh, in some in some images, there would be a circle surrounding the anchor and the dolphin, indicating time, even eternal time. The anchor that uh, indicates restraint and deliberation and the dolphin which indicates speed and swiftness um, living together in a kind of paradoxical union well thanks for taking time with me um, I hope that you'll make some additional connections to uh, practical application in the classroom another way of saying this is master each step as you go and teach towards mastery now I'll ask my trusty assistant if we've gotten any comments. Nope, we've been unable to do that, so I apologize. But it may be a bit delay. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we'll wait just uh, a couple more minutes because uh, um, there may be a bit, a bit of a delay in in your comments coming in to, to uh, flowing into the computer. So what I'm going to do as I delay, because this did happen before, there's about a about a two minute two or three minute lag from what you see and what and what uh, in, the, in the comments coming into the computer. So let me talk about just a couple other resources that are also related to Festina Lente. I've mentioned uh, uh, the intellectual life. I've mentioned leisure, the basis of culture. And by the way, if you go to our website and um, uh, if you go to the store on the left hand side, there's a, a number of different series you can look at on the store section of the website you'll see a section that says recommended reading. Um, that recommended reading section is where you'll find some of these books. Um, I'll talk about uh, this book, Beauty for Truth's Sake. It's published by, um, it's written by Stratford uh, Caldecott, and it's subtitled on the re-enchantment of education. This is really a book about mathematics and how mathematics are connected to beauty. So, um, I found this book was astounding because um, I didn't get a very good mathematics education and I was taught mathematics almost purely as functional math. I was never taught to play with math or very very seldomly taught to play with math and nor was I shown kind of shown how mathematics is a language and how mathematics is a beautiful language. So beauty in math was something that I just didn't really think about and it didn't seem that my teachers did either. But now this book opened my eyes to see and some other friends I have that mathematics really does have a beautiful aspect that's aesthetic. Um, I've become much more attracted to math. And you know, if you love something, you'll study it. So I'm more interested in knowing math. Um, for example, one of the things that uh, Caldecott brings, brings up in this book, uh, Beauty for True Sake, is that uh, m music is the incarnation of math. That m music uh, in the liberal arts tradition was a study of of uh, mathematical ratios. You've heard of something like the perfect third or a perfect fifth and so forth and a seventh. These are all mathematically related notes and harmonies and various uh, uh, thirds and fifths and so on sound really good. And isn't it interesting that what is pleasing to us mathematically in terms of their ratios are also pleasing to our ear. So um, he and others say that when you hear music, you're actually bodily experiencing mathematics. That kind of stuff made me stop and think. Uh, he also mentions that, for example, if you take a plate of sand and you vibrate it at random frequencies, what you get is a plate of sand. But if you vibrate that plate of sand according to harmonious frequencies, beautiful geometric patterns begin to emerge. Why is that? Um, and then there's also just some really interesting things regarding uh, various uh, sequences and patterns and, of uh, 
mathematical numbers that um, numbers that that we, we know that certain sequences exist and sometimes we can predict that something is going to happen in a particular sequence uh, on to infinity but we can't prove it yet and then there are math ma mathematicians who are working to prove things that we think we know but can't really prove mathematically that's fascinating to me so I really enjoyed this book and then one more that I'll mention is Norms and Nobility uh, this is published by David um, written by David Hicks and uh, published by the University Press of America and this is a a heavy read, uh, not something you'll read in you know two or three days, but it does a it does a fantastic job of acquainting us with how the Greek and Roman tradition was imported and uh, adapted into the Christian West. Uh, shows how um, the liberal arts, as they were developed at first by the Greeks and Romans, was then um, appropriated by the the Christian Church and um, and actually codified and described and expanded and applied. Uh, it also has a nice sample curriculum at the back of the book that will suggest to you some ways that you might want to uh, organize um, your own curriculum with your students. More to say about it, but I'll leave it there. How are we doing? Okay, I'm going to uh, address a couple of a uh, couple of questions here for you. If you're getting the top of my forehead, I apologize because I'm going to I'm just stepping a little close to the computer to see it. Uh, how do you know when you've achieved mastery and are ready to move on? Are there common features? Let's see here if I can move that. There we go. Are there common features to mastery across subjects? That's from uh, Kylie Johnson. Kylie, that's a really important question. It is important to begin with the end in mind. And so to think about what mastery looks like in a particular art or subject is a really important thing to do. Of course, it's not easy. So you do want to give some thought to um, what that is. Um, oh, you know, I would, before I try to answer it positively, let me answer that question negatively. Don't simply look at a textbook and say, well, here are all the chapters in this textbook. That must mean uh, if I do all of these chapters, I have mastered something. Now, I'm, I'm a textbook publisher, although I don't like to use the word textbooks so, so much anymore. Textbooks have their own problems. But however, um, you know, a textbook or a published resource is not your curriculum. It is a resource to help you teach a curriculum. So for example, um, Mathematics. You want to teach. You want to teach your children mathematics, and you want them to master mathematics. You don't necessarily want to teach Saxon math or Matthew C or Singapore math or some of these other math curricula. They all have their strengths and weaknesses, I, I think. But you want to teach mathematics, and those those are resources. Those those printed materials are resources to help you teach mathematics. That's what a curriculum really is. It's a course that you study. I think the best way to answer the question is to go to someone who's a master and, and ask that person, what is mastery? The people who really know what mastery is are the people who have acquired the skills and capacities. They'll give you the best answers. Um, for example, if you wanted to um, become a, ma a master carpenter, um, rather than just looking at a book, it would be good to actually meet someone who embodies that mastery and get to know that person and, and trust that person with a description of the resources as well. Now, having said that, I think there are some published resources that are helpful that will describe it, but it's certainly beyond the scope here, um, scope of this webinar for me to describe that in every particular subject. I just answer, I'll just give you one more idea and then I'll have to move on with Latin. I know something about Latin. What mastery I think looks like in Latin is the ability to uh, fluently, that means without a lot of interruption, read an original Latin text with understanding. And fluently, of course, can have different shades of meaning. Sometimes we use words like um, um, conversant, uh, proficient. But fluency means, uh, from the word fluid, it means you don't have to stop. So if someone can pick up, say, the Latin Vulgate or Cicero or Augustine and read and understand without constantly having to look up words and phrases and grammatical concepts, that person has gotten to a, a place of mastery. That might be one sign of mastery, not the only one. Another sign of mastery in Latin would be having uh, memorized some significant portions of Latin so that it's stored up in this person's mind and memory and has become a part of the person. 
mastery in literature, I think, is that's one aspect of mastery in literature, is that literature has become a part of you. It's not just that you've completed a degree or you've read a certain number of books, because reading, as masters of literature will tell you, is rereading. The, the great books aren't to be read just one time. They're so great that you have to keep coming back to them. I think memorization when it comes to literature is important. Someone who has mastered something usually has usually has uh, concepts and skills and knowledge committed to memory, so that they are uh, that these 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 uh, these riches are at their disposal instantly. This is a person who doesn't have to Google everything. This is a person whom you would like to Google. <laughs> All right, um, let me go on to the next question. Um, should I go below or, or on top? Okay, uh, 09 Eudora says, thank you for this webinar. Pulled kids out of school this year, had to fight the pressure to forge ahead, especially in math, but I took a fifth grader back to fourth grade math to make sure the basics were in place. That's great. So you're, you, are, you, are, you want to master each step. Getting the, mastering those basics is, 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 is certainly important. And let's go to Brianna Paternoster which is a great Latin name. It means our father. Um, Brianna says, I think Pieper also said that prudence was the chief virtue, that self-control and right judgment were needed for diligence and such. You know, Brianna, you're right in that all these virtues are related. They don't stand uh, like individual pearls, uh, or actually, pearls don't stand. They're not like pearls on a table. They're all on a string. They're all in communion with one another. In fact, I think you could say that every virtue needs to be in communication with other virtues. The chief virtue is love. Uh, typically theologians say that the chief virtue is love and humility. And without love and humility, um, the other virtues can't be virtues. And the chief vice is sloth. So that could be a really interesting webinar, just to describe the virtues and how they relate to one another. Um, but uh, you're right to, to think of wisdom as one of the chief virtues. It is. It's usually a <clears throat> wisdom is something that comes after a long life lived well. Okay, well, I want to thank you for, for your comments and your questions, and thanks for being um, for, with us today. And next month, we'll be going on to the second maxim, which is multum non multa, the second essential principle of classical pedagogy. And multum non multa is kind of a sister concept of festival. It means much, not many. I hope to see you then.